Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. It is a part of existence. We see it all over the place. Two tectonic plates rubbing against one another, building friction until finally one releases and you get an earthquake. You get a nice, warm, humid day like this and a cold front comes through thunderstorms. You see it in the animal kingdom where there's competition, competition for territory, competition for food, competition for water. And often there's a fight that breaks out. And yes, you know what I'm talking about, conflict among one another. Sometimes it's just the way I think versus the way you think. Sometimes it's really bad things that are going on that are just wrong. But often we find it. Things just aren't the way they should be. And conflict springs up. Well, we've got lots of conflict in the world. There's no question about that. But how do you resolve it? How do you resolve the conflict? Lots of ways to resolve the conflict. Obviously, if it's a situation of right versus wrong, you want to stand for the right, you want the right to win. So you go for that, and you don't really give up. But what about when it's not right versus wrong? What about those gray areas? What if it's just my idea versus your idea? What if it's my preference versus your preference? What do you do? Well, you compromise. That's turned into a dirty word in our society, hasn't it? Compromise. Doesn't that just, does, doesn't that give you that sort of feeling like, compromise? Really, do I have to compromise? Compromise, that's bad, bad. Compromising is bad. Because in our minds these days, and I don't know where this came from, but when we think of compromise, we think of giving in, right? For, for us today, it's like this all or nothing, winners, losers kind of mentality, where, where if, if I haven't scored one for myself or my side of the equation, I've lost. Meeting in the middle is just not that much of an option anymore. And you can see it. I mean, it's, it's really all over society, but I hate to bring the world of politics in, but that's where we see it probably most acutely, is that you get two sides of an aisle, right? And, and each one's trying to score a point for their side, their team. And, and anything that comes from the other side is, is deemed evil, and, and there is no meaning in the middle. And nothing gets done, because the conflict has little to do with what's actually going on with the solve problems that they're trying to solve. And, and, and if you, it's, it's, it's really indicative of our entire society, right? It's not just there in, in a Congress someplace. We also see it in the church. Don't, don't act too shocked. Yeah, it's in the church. It really is. Um, local churches, like ours, big denominations, even bigger church around the world, there's conflict. I mean, you, you, you would have had to, uh, to listen to our three lessons today and like plug your ears and go la 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 to miss that, right? All three of our lessons, you could feel it. There was conflict there in those lessons. How, how is that conflict going to be resolved? How are we going to, to, uh, to deal with, with the, these issues, these problems? We see this in the Christian church as much as anywhere else in society. The questions that I have in regards to conflict and compromise, though, are, I mean, where is the conflict? What's the conflict about? Um, is the conflict regarding something that we can change? Or is it something that we can't? Where is the compromise here? Are we dealing with something where we can compromise? Or are we not dealing with something where we can compromise? These are all questions that surround conflict and compromise when it comes to being a Christian. And 
We see this especially in Acts chapter 15. There are two major conflicts that are happening in Acts 15. We read one of them, and I'll talk about the other one in just a minute. But the major conflict in Acts chapter 15 has to do with Jews and Gentiles. And the problem is, the gospel is for everybody. That's the problem. The Gentiles have just as much a right to the gospel of Jesus Christ as the Jews do. And that made the Jews kind of upset. Now they had all the tradition. God had adopted the Israelite people. God had said to Moses, you know, you're, you're going to be my people. I'm going to give you this land. You're going to be a blessing to the nations. Um, and so they, are, they feel a right to say that all these traditions, all of these customs that were given to them are simply a part of the package. If you want to be a Christian, you're going to take all of, Christ, all of the Jewish history and we're going to plop that onto being a Christian. The problem with that is that Jesus superseded all of that. You don't need that tradition to be a Christian. And, and they, they know that. The Jews knew that. Because their prophets, who had also predicted Jesus, also told everybody, this is for the Gentiles too. And you can even you can even tell with what, what Peter said from our lesson today. Here, I'll read it again. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then. Why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No. We believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. So he's basically saying to them, okay, what's our track record been on keeping all of these laws? Let's just go back. Let's take a look. And of course the track record is abysmal. So you want us to tell them to do the things that we can't do ourselves? Really? No. Jesus has freed us from all of that. And you can tell that the assembly there in Jerusalem was convinced that there was still a problem. And the problem was that all of these Jews still really hold this very tightly. And they're going to need to interact with these Gentiles we don't. What are we going to do? This is where James comes in. And James, this is the James, the brother of Jesus, who is the, the leader of the Jerusalem church. Verse 19. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. So there we have it, the compromise. And I'm telling you, this is a huge moment in Christian history. If they couldn't compromise on this, if they couldn't figure it out, then Christianity would be relegated to a Jewish sect, right? And, and I'm sure God would have found another way to, to grow it. But we wouldn't be looking at this and saying what a positive example it was. We'd be looking back and saying, wow, look at how the church couldn't get their act together to get the gospel out. The, one of the reasons this is so important for us is we can take a look at this compromise and see what they were able to compromise on and what they weren't able to compromise on. This is very important for us because we live in a day and age where we have to make similar choices as Christians. So we look at this, we look at this uh, compromise, and I notice a few things that they aren't compromising on right away. They're not compromising on the Ten Commandments. They don't look at those Ten Commandments and say, hmm, Ten Suggestions. No. No, they're saying, this is the way God made our world to be in the first place. So we can't compromise on that. And then they don't compromise on the Gospel. They're, they're doing this. The whole reason they are in and meeting and doing this whole thing is so that the gospel can be for everybody. 
So they didn't go and say, well, you can only have the gospel if you do this. You know, or only people who are like this can get the gospel. They didn't play that game. No, everybody gets the gospel. What they did compromise on were the sensitivities of the Jewish people. But I want to point out one thing that didn't show up there. It's huge. And that's circumcision. This was the number one thing for a Jew. Number one. And it's not on the list. So this means the Jewish people were willing to say, okay, probably had to swallow hard on this one. We're setting that aside. But just so that you don't really, really offend the Jewish people, why don't you stay away from those idol sacrificed meats and, and the strangled animals and blood, okay? And if you can do that, I think we're going to be able to set aside circumcision. That's huge. That is huge. It flung the doors wide open to allow the Jews and the Gentiles to mix. And you know who won? God did. Because they held on to the law and they held on to the gospel. And they let the petty squabbles work themselves out. Speaking of squabbles, this gets me to the other conflict in chapter 15, if you had a chance to read it. Uh, at the end of the chapter, we see Paul and Barnabas, who are ready to go off on their second missionary journey. And Barnabas wants to bring John Mark. The problem is, John Mark abandoned them in their last trip. And Paul was really offended by that. And so he's just like, no, the guy's not trustworthy, but I don't want him along. And Barnabas is like, no, 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 we can take him, we can take him, really. Give the guy a second chance. And Paul's like, no. Compromise? Not this time. The disagreement was so sharp that Paul picked up a different traveling buddy in Silas, and Barnabas went off with John Mark. I'm sorry I can't give you a great positive example this time, but they didn't. They left. They split. What did God do with it? A lot. Now, instead of one dynamic duo, you have two. And they're going off to different places. And John Mark, he's the guy who wrote the Gospel of Mark. Wow. So probably the message from, from that story, as much as anything else, is that it's God's church. Okay? It's God's church. Not yours, not mine. It's his kingdom, and he's the one in charge of it, and he'll even take the times when we make poor choices or the times when we can't compromise. He can use those for his kingdom and for his good. But I'll tell you something. It often works best when we can compromise. When we can come together and realize that my opinion is not as important as your opinion, or vice versa. When we're able to, to give a little so that God wins. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we live in a day where Christianity, or, or large chunks of Christianity, is willing to compromise on the things that should not be compromised upon. They're willing to say that the Ten Commandments are just suggestions. And they're trying to say that the gospel isn't really all that great. can't be. It just can't be. We have an example from the scriptures that were very, very clear. I mean, we, even, we even saw two of, two of the suggestions from, from, from James were directly related to the Ten Commandments. The, the first commandment where you're talking about the food sacrifice to idols, and the second commandment or the second one, which was associated with the sixth commandment regarding sexual immorality. There's, he's saying, no, 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 we've got to keep these ten commandments. We can't go and think that we're bigger than the way God that made this world in the first place. I thank God that we are part of a larger group, a denomination, where those aren't the issues. I really do thank God for that. 
One of the problems that we have, though, is that when those things aren't the issues, we start making other things into issues. Bigger issues, non-compromising issues, you know. And the fact of the matter is, we need God to win. There's always going to be conflict, okay? You're never going to get out of that. But God has to win in the end. So if it's a matter of, of how we, we conduct a worship service, if it's, if it's a matter of trying to get along with different types of people, if it's, if it's a matter of how, we, how do we reach out to our neighborhood, we've got to come together, figure something out together, and realize that even though you may not have won, we can pray that God wins. When his law is kept intact, when his gospel is kept intact, and we are humble in trying to be the ones to communicate that, because by God's grace, when we are able to communicate that, people go to heaven. That's awesome. And I'm sorry, but there is no win in any of these arguments that's greater than the win of when somebody has eternal life. So this is just a, a reminder for us. Okay, I'm not trying to point any fingers necessarily. This is just a healthy reminder for us that God wins. Sometimes God even wins when we lose. But let me tell you, when God wins, we all win. Amen.